We will continue the afternoon um, with Stuart Bergman. He's coming back to us. Many of you know him already from prior meetings. Stuart is the Deputy Chief Economist and Director of the Economic and Political Intelligence Center at Export Development Canada. His topic today is Global Macroeconomic Outlook. The race is on. Please. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Kristen, and thank you for inviting me back again. Uh, it's always a pleasure to come out here to uh, New York, though I have uh, another complaint this year that the Yankees didn't follow COFAS's schedule, uh, and so I haven't been able to get out and see a Yankees game now for two, two times, two meetings that I've been out here, but we'll talk to Mr. Steinbrenner maybe. You focus too much on soccer. Too much on soccer, yeah, maybe. It's, it's better than focusing too much on hockey. Um, so thank you for, uh, for having me back. Uh, I'll get right into it because I know we are uh, strictly timed for these things. So what's to talk about? I mean, I, we can talk about, uh, there certainly are no shortages of negative things to talk about. We've heard that. Jeez, I thought I was a pessimist. I thought I was the bear. But after listening to my two predecessors, I, I think uh, I'm going to be the optimist in the bunch. Uh, but, you know, I suppose we can talk about commodity prices, we can talk about oil prices, WTI down uh, this morning at uh, $43 a barrel, even as Iran and Saudi Arabia seem to be jostling it out for supremacy in that part of the world, and that is certainly unlikely to end well. Russia and OPEC are talking about production freezes, and in advance of that, prices surged, oil prices surged to $41. <laughs> surged to four. I mean, in normal times, that would have sent prices skyrocketing. You'll notice that black line over there, I hope you can see it, the black line up there is our all energy index, commodity index. So energy's been the big loser here, but it hasn't just been energy. Commodities in general, reminiscent of the rout of 2008. And so what does that mean for currencies? Well, not surprisingly, emerging market currencies, that, or at least those that depend on those commodity prices, have been, have been hit hard. As a result of that, that fall in commodity prices, the, the rise in global risk aversion, the so-called liftoff of US interest rates in Canada, I put up there in red, in Canada, we're behaving a bit like an emerging market as well. You can see that our dollar, the loonie, uh, is now up. It's up to 79 cents. It's up to 79 cents. I mean, think about that. We were talking at a Canadian dollar uh, well above parity not too long ago. We're up to 79 cents now. And so what does that mean for equity markets. Well, again, not surprisingly, more than half, or rather more than, I would say even more than that, probably about 80% of the 34 largest emerging market stock markets that we track are firmly in negative territory. Not just down since their peak, down just since last year. Emerging market bond spreads through the roof. And it's not just the emerging markets, developed markets also. The FT's developed market equity index is down between uh, 10 and 15% depending on the day that you look at it. High yield corporate bond spreads in the United States have started to tick up in a very noticeable way. In fact, pretty much all high yield sectors in the US have lost significant value since the beginning of the year. The one exception to that, the one exception, tobacco junk bonds. <laughs> tobacco junk bonds. So you know people are pretty nervous Right when cigarettes sound like a solid investment strategy. <laughs> you want to talk about nerves, this is the VIX. I'm sure that you're familiar with it. For those of you that are not familiar with it, it's the Chicago Board Options Exchange Volatility Index. It's the famous fear gauge. And if you're not familiar with it, it basically tells you market expectations of volatility on the S&P over the next 30 days. So you can see that since June of 2014, we have been on a wild ride. And it's not just high levels of volatility, it's the volatility of volatility. We don't even know anymore if things are volatile or not. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. We can't even get a handle on volatility anymore. You'll notice that the long-term average of this index is at about 20, it's 19.95. Look what's happened in the last six months alone. So what do you want to talk about? Again, I throw a dart. There are things to talk about out there. High or, uh, or high frequency indicators are kind of going in, in counterintuitive directions. Well, for me, I'll say that the biggest, the most significant event for this year, 
didn't actually even happen in 2016. If I'm going to be completely consistent, I'll say that the biggest, the most significant event for this year didn't even happen this decade. What am I talking about? Let's take a step back a little bit to late 2007, when the fallout from the complete ignorance surrounding the true value, the real value of lower quality US mortgage-backed securities quickly spread throughout the global financial system to others with exposure to those toxic assets. When the US government refused to bail out Lehman Brothers, the resulting surge in counterparty risk aversion pretty well caused financial markets to seize up. Right, once trade finance dried up, panic spread from Wall Street to Main Street, consumers stopped buying, businesses stopped investing, and the global financial crisis gave way to a collapse of international trade unlike anything any of us has ever seen in our lifetimes. Forget about our careers, in our lifetimes. The Great Recession, we called it. We're really good at coming up with these catchy titles. The Great Recession. The biggest global financial economic meltdown since the Depression itself. Except this time, policymakers claim to have learned the lessons. Their lessons from the 1930s. In fact, the man who was at the helm of arguably the world's most important central bank, Ben Bernanke at the time, himself was a student of that particular era of economic history, right? And so in 2009, policymakers, governments, central bankers from around the world came together to unleash a wave of massive and unprecedentedly coordinated public stimulus measures. Interest rates were cut to basically zero. Huge amounts of money were thrown at the financial sector. And the world's most powerful governments came together to unleash enormous fiscal stimulus packages. And then, then, and this is it, this is the key, this to me is the most important event for this year that didn't actually happen this year, it started happening in 2009. And then, in the United States, having exhausted the standard tools of monetary policy, with the Fed funds rate basically at zero, the Fed begins buying assets. Right, assets like mortgage-backed securities. We called it quantitative easing, QE. In fact, before the recession, the Fed had about $900 billion worth of assets on its balance sheet. Following three successive rounds of QE, Fed assets peaked at around $4.5 trillion. $4.5 trillion. Five times the amount back in the summer of 2008. I mean, this was enormous. This was unprecedented in terms of its sheer scale, in terms of the sheer size, the magnitude of this. Never before in the course of modern economic history, in the course of history, economic history, had a central bank pummeled so much cash into a single economy. And it wasn't just the US, right? The Bank of England, eventually the European Central Bank, even the Swedish National Bank, unveiled their own QE projects. Over this period of time, Aggregate global liquidity increased by some $9 trillion. Remember that, we'll get back to that a little bit later. $9 trillion increase in aggregate global liquidity. And so the impact of all this, of all those measures, was absolutely dramatic. Right? Fiscal stimulus, government stimulus, put money back in the hands of consumers. Financial institutions, or at least those that survived, and others like the bailed out auto companies, focus their attention on rebuilding their balance sheet. Lower borrowing costs encouraged consumers to start buying again with the hope that business investment would soon follow. Tighter financial regulation was meant to help restore confidence in the global economy. And now, now e-liquid assets were in some cases ring-fenced or just simply replaced outright with cash altogether. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. That sounds impressive, doesn't it? They thought it was impressive. This to me, I like to, to equate this to you know, the, the economic, the financial market equivalent to George W. Bush's military doctrine of shock and awe. And as far as I see it, the consequences were no less impactful, both on the upside and on the downside. In fact, two consequences in particular stand out to me. The first, not surprisingly, is growth. Are you, I mean, you put that much life support into an economy, you better have growth. If someone's got to lose their job. The very next year, the very next year, global growth popped up to 5.4%. 5.4%. That is absolutely miraculous. That is well above the average of the last 30 years and among the fastest growing years on record for the global economy. 
And global trade? Well, pretty much back to where it was before the crisis, maybe even a little bit beyond that. Just like that, as if nothing ever happened. I mean, you think about it. We get hit with what was apparently the biggest financial economic collapse since the Depression, and within a year, a year the global economy resumes its growth trajectory? A V-shaped recovery, that's what we called it at the time, a V-shaped recovery. As quickly as we fell into this thing, we're going to pop back out. Now, unfortunately, what happened over the next couple of years was a series of, of what we called serial disappointments. A few years of serial, it was sort of the confluence of perfect events that masked many, much of this growth. So we had inclement weather, a spate of natural disasters. Right? We had flooding in northeastern Australia an earthquake in New Zealand, the tsunami hit Japan, tornadoes in the US South. We had an earthquake in Turkey, flooding in Thailand. We've had extreme cold weather conditions to start the last few calendar years here in the US Northeast, and that certainly hasn't helped growth in this part of the world. We also had volatile politics. So we had the Arab Spring and a spate of other geopolitical disturbances, right? Russia, Ukraine. The rise, and I would say maybe even more surprisingly or more importantly, the staying power of the so-called Islamic State. In addition, to further add to you know, this kind of perfect storm, 2012 saw government stimulus measures give way to government austerity measures, both in the United States and in Europe. And so you had the governments of Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy focus their attention on rebuilding their own balance sheet. Greece fell into a, a protracted crisis that it's still digging itself out of. And we'll hear more about, uh, about Europe in the next session. But you know, I believe that while Greece has to some extent fallen to the back ends of the financial pages these days, we're going to start to hear more and more about Greece as we get closer to the summer. They have some major repayment humps that are coming due this summer. The Eurozone slashed almost 40 billion euros off of its budget that year in 2012, subtracting directly from bottom line growth and inflicting severe economic pain in the region. In the United States, the, the fiscal drag in 2013 in the form of so-called sequestration and other automatic stabilizers took 1.8% off GDP growth. 1.8%. That, that's huge. That means that if what was reported at the end of the day in the US was that growth was 1.5%, the underlying economy actually grew by more like 3.3%. The government just ripped 1.8% off of that bottom line growth. That's enormous. And so while underlying economic activity at this point, mainly in the private sector, had already been kickstarted by the previous stimulus efforts, and we know that because global trade volumes continue to power forward, notwithstanding that, what we get is a whole bunch of flat on the growth side. And it's about that time that we start to hear, the f we first start to hear, we're still, we just talked about it in the last session, we first start to hear about this new normal, right? this new normal, this, this prolonged period of, of weak and uninspired growth. But with austerity measures having largely run their course, in developed markets at least, and particularly in the, year, in the US and in Europe, some of that growth is actually starting to poke through now. We're starting to see kind of the green shoots of that growth that was there all along in the underlying economy that was being masked by kind of this confluence of forces. And the prevailing concern among monetary policy officials mainly in the United States at this point, has shifted to whether there may be more liquidity in this system for what's appropriate at this given point in the cycle. Right? Because if you have an economy that returns to growth and you still have all this stimulus cash inside of the economy, the concern becomes that you may have more cash in the, in the system than you have goods and services available for purchase. Right? And so as that mountain of cash competes to buying for buying somewhat limited goods and services, the only release valve is prices. Right? Inflation. And so if that's the case, and if you're a central banker and your primary mandate is price stability, you've got to start slopping up some of that excess liquidity and you've got to start doing it very quickly. In fact, I know this is not a popular belief given all the negative news we're used to hearing about these days and reading about, about the global economy, but we happen to believe that the US Federal Reserve is actually somewhat behind the curve in this regard. Now, how can I say that? How can I come here after everything we've heard in the first session, after everything we're used to reading about these days, and tell you that I believe that not only is the US economy at risk of growing, but it's at risk of growing beyond its own capacity. Well, 
I believe that the housing market does a really good job telling that story. Those of you that have seen me speak before, you know that we like to look at the housing market as a forward-looking indicator. We believe it's an extremely strong forward-looking indicator for the US economy. Let me explain to you why. As a general rule of thumb, in the United States, it takes about 1.4 million new units, new homes, every year to keep up with natural demand growth in this country. It's what economists refer to as net household formation. That's the red line that you see up there. What you also see is that between 2001 and 2006, we were building homes at a pace of between 1.6 and 2.3 million new units per year. And so it was over this period that this overbuild led to the massive accumulation of surplus homes. And this line here, that's the pace of housing starts, right? So about 1.6 to 2.3 million units per year. This overbuild led to this massive accumulation of surplus homes that you can see in the bars that peaked somewhere around 2007 at almost 3 million units, 3 million extra additional units beyond what the economy needs. And so it's the reason why we needed to have a recession in housing, if not an outright depression, in order to halt new construction, right? Stop adding to the glut and even start working some of that glut down, some of that surplus down. And so we went from building at a pace of 2.3 million units per year down to a pace of 500,000 units per year. An 80% plunge in housing construction. 80% plunge in housing construction. But remember, it's not just an 80% plunge in housing construction. Because with that plunge in housing construction comes a, a fall off in demand for all the stuff you need to build those homes, right? Construction materials. All the fancy things that Americans like to jam into their homes. Consumer durables. Even the services that's related to all of that activity. And what's more is we stay down there and we stay down there for between two and a half to three years, ostensibly working down those excesses. But when you have a set level of demographic requirements inside of an economy, right, that 1.4 million mark, that's, that's structural, that's there. It may oscillate, you know, more people shacking up with their parents, or, but you know, generally it's about 1.4 million units. When you have that set level of demographic requirements, while you can stay down at 500,000 units for a while, you can't stay down there forever. Right? At 500,000 units, we are basically just building a third of what's required just to keep pace with population changes in the country. And so it's why we see that surplus come down over time, eventually hit balance, and even shift into a slight deficit. So we've now got to get back up to that 1.4 million unit mark, and if history is any guide, maybe even slightly beyond that, in order to keep that deficit from growing. So there is easily, easily another what? 20% growth inside of that market over the next couple of years? Right? We've got to get from where we are there back up to 1.4, maybe a little bit beyond. That's easily another 20% growth inside of that market alone. And so home builders are pretty pumped about that activity. In fact, the National Association of Home Builders Forward-Looking Housing Market Index, by the end of last year, got back to levels not seen since 2005. And we know it was happening in 2005 in the US housing market. But it's more than just home builders that I believe should be excited about all this activity. Because remember, that sets off a whole bunch of activity in terms of the demand for all that stuff you need to build those homes, the, the, the housing materials, the, the construction materials, in terms of demand for all those consumer durables that people want to buy to fill their homes with, in terms of the services that's required for all that building, for the buying, for the selling. And that's a big chunk of consumer spending. And that creates jobs. In fact, the US economy has been creating jobs at a torrid pace over the last little while somewhere to the tune of 283, 284,000 new jobs per month in the last quarter of last year. So look what that's done to the unemployment rate. We're down to that 5% level. And that's a real risk because any time historically unemployment has come down to those levels before, there's been a real danger of wage inflation setting in in the United States. In fact, real wages in the US have jumped to historically high levels. We just got word uh, this morning that unit labor costs in Q1 were up more than 4%. Strongest levels we've seen for a while. And so back to the Fed's dilemma, that is not good for price stability. They're keeping their eyes on that. That is not good for price stability. But it's more than just the Fed that needs to be concerned about that. Because the US consumer is a powerful locomotive. Not just for the US economy, accounting for 70% of this economy, but for all those countries that sell to the US, 
and for all those countries that sell to the sellers, right, the providers of, of raw materials. Because if the U.S. consumer accounts for 70% of this economy, and the U.S. economy is what, 16% of the global economy? That puts the U.S. consumer directly responsible for 11 cents of every dollar in the world. That is powerful stuff. And that, to us, is why we look at the housing market the way we do. That has the power to unleash a huge amount of growth in the global economy. Why then all the volatility? Why all the pessimism about where things are at? Well, now is when I get back to QE, right? The, the most significant event for this year that didn't actually happen this year, that happened starting in 2009. And the second major consequence of that key event that I alluded to earlier. Remember, the first consequence was growth, right? The, the green shoots of growth that we're starting to see poke through in certain parts of the economy. 2009, we get hit with what was apparently the biggest global economic financial downturn since the Depression, and within a year, a year, the global economy resumes its growth trajectory. Now, I'm not saying that things had been seamless, and we had our serial disappointments, but we've talked about some of that underlying growth that was happening right through that period in terms of the pent-up demand, pent-up demand among consumers, like in the United States in the U.S. housing market. We're also, by the way, seeing pent-up demand among consumers in Europe as well, and I'm not going to get into that. We're seeing pent-up demand among businesses in the U.S. Businesses are finding that their capacity utilization has slowly creeped back up to peak levels of capacity utilization prior to the crisis when they had a hard time meeting the demand that was coming their way. So there is significant pent-up demand that's emerging in the economy, and it's not just in the U.S. We're starting to see that on the European side as well. So that gives you a sense of the sheer magnitude of the collective stimulus that's been implemented over the last eight years, right? We go from the biggest crisis since the Depression to all of a sudden we're seeing pent-up demand. It gives you a sense of the magnitude of this, this collective stimulus that we've implemented over the last eight years, much of which was done through unconventional means, like aggregate global liquidity injections of $9 trillion. So given that, given that, was it really reasonable for us to expect that at some point, at some point, we wouldn't have to contend with the macroeconomic distortions that fall out of this type of an unorthodox policy. I mean, governments have been paying for their free spending ways for years now. Many governments will continue to pay well into the future. Japan comes to mind. So was it really reasonable for us to expect that we'd be able to implement an unorthodox policy like that and not have to deal with the macroeconomic distortions that fall out of it? What were those distortions? Well, given all the excess capacity that was floating around the global economy during the crisis years, very little of that cash actually found its way into the economy where it was supposed to go. In the real economy, right? It wasn't needed. There was no, there was no need for it. Remember, consumers were deleveraging. They weren't buying anything. So businesses had more than enough capacity to keep up with whatever piddly demand was coming their way, right? They had invested big time in the 2004 to 2007 period. They didn't need to invest. In fact, they were scared to invest. They didn't know what the future would hold. All they were hearing was, we're headed into the, the, into the depression. So where does that money go? It can't just sit there, right? Businesses, investors can't take that cash and stick it under their mattresses. It's got to make a return. It's got it's to it's show some return. Where does that go? Well, given the massive amount of money that was out there chasing yield, and with rates at historically low levels, in the negative in some cases, Securing a decent return meant venturing further and further along that risk continuum, right? As that mountain of cash helped compress yields. Let me explain what I mean. You're a CFO of a company. You have a record amount of cash on your bottom line. And that was the case. In the United States, companies had record amounts of cash on their bottom line as the crisis unfolded, right? They had some good years in the 04 to 07 period. They had all these liquidity injections. There was a record amount of cash on the bottom line of companies. You're the CFO. You have all this cash on your bottom line. You have shareholders or your board of directors that's breathing down your neck that's saying to you, we want to see some return. Show us some, go out and deploy that cash. We get we're in a crisis, so deploy it responsibly, but deploy that cash and show us some return. So you say, okay, fine. You take that money and you head out into kind of the risk-free space in the market, right? Where, you know, you're not taking on any additional risk, right? Because we're, we're going into the depression. Yields are razor thin, but you're making some return and you're quite happy with that. Problem is, everyone does the same thing. Bids up prices, compresses yields. You're not making your return anymore. You're not doing what your shareholders have asked you to do. 
So you gotta go one step further into the riskier space in the market. Again, you're starting to make some return. You're pretty happy with that. That mountain of cash follows you, bids up prices, compresses yields. And the same thing keeps happening again and again and again. And so much of that liquidity found its way to the more speculative end of the market, prompting investors to embrace a host of higher risk assets higher risk assets at increasingly de declining returns, returns that weren't adequately compensating them for the risk that they assumed. And so a lot of that cash found its way into things like currencies, right, the carry trade, emerging market bonds, equity markets, commodities. How do we know that? Well, we know that because in the summer of 2008, oil prices in black fall off a cliff in the wake of the global downturn. And while the global economy is, is mired in recession, in depression, and there have been no changes to production, supply remains the same, demand is in the toilet, between 2008 and 2011, oil prices surge 270%. Why? Copper. Copper is traditionally a bellwether of global industrial activity, right? It's for its industrial uses. In 2009, copper saw its prices go up 123%. 123% increase in copper prices. Historically, you'd think the global economy was doing pretty well. Anyone know what global growth was in 2009? Zero. No growth. Yet copper prices are up 123%. So you have to think that something other than fundamentals is driving prices. And so everybody took advantage. Money was cheap. Issuers of debt took advantage. I would. US junk bond issuances surged after 2009. The government of Zambia Zambia, in 2012, issued a $750 million euro bond that was 24 times oversubscribed. Zambia. <laughs> the government of Ecuador, Ecuador, who up until that point had never seen a sovereign bond issuance through to maturity, in June of 2014, issued a 10-year $2 billion bond oversubscribed. The previous month, Pakistan, oversubscribed. And so the private sector, companies in the emerging markets just follow their governments. Private sector debt in emerging markets climbed from the equivalent of $5.4 trillion to $24.4 trillion, a $19 trillion surge in private sector emerging market debt, much of which went to so-called SOE, state-owned enterprises, ballooning the off-balance sheet liabilities of many sovereigns in the emerging markets. And so all this yield chasing helped prop up asset prices in many cases far beyond what fundamentals would suggest was, was reasonable, even what was even sane at that point. And by the way, all this momentum in commodities like oil, what does that do? Well, commodity producers are pretty convinced that the good times are here to stay, right? So that prompts a whole bunch of investment and exploration activity. Why not? Right? Prices are up. Who cares why they're up? If you went in on the action, you got to go drill yourself a well. And don't worry about it, it's sustainable, it's the new normal, right? We had a famous economist on, on Bay Street, our Wall Street, who was at the time talking about, you know, $200 oil. He's selling tons of books and, you know, making the speaking circuit. And we were looking at it and saying, where, where is this coming from? Where are the fundamentals behind this? It's all sustainable, it's, don't worry about it, don't ask too many questions. The problem is, is that left us with a huge amount of supply Supplies that couldn't be justified given demand fundamentals at the time. We didn't actually have the demand at the time. And so, I don't know if you ever heard the dictum that there's no cure to high prices like high prices. Well, it's okay if you hadn't heard that because you lived through it. That's what we lived through. And by the way, all this is sustainable. As long as we keep this process going, right? As long as we continue to feed the beast with money. But remember, back at the halls of justice, we have Fed officials that are concerned about falling behind the curve and allowing price stability to get out of control. And that's not an easy predicament because it usually takes monetary policy between 12 to 18 months to work its way through the system. And so, on December 17th, 2015, the United States Federal Reserve raises interest rates for the first time in 10 years. 10 years. The last time the Fed increased interest rates, Twitter wasn't around. And the moment the Fed decides to tighten up, in fact, you don't even have to tighten up, you just have to say you're gonna tighten up. Because I don't know if you remember what happened on May 21st, 2013. I remember, because that's my job. May 21st, 2013, then chair of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, first publicly mused 
around the possibility that maybe at some point, perhaps, we may have to think about, you know, if the stars perfectly align, tapering the amount of money going, tapering the amount of money going into the system. We're not even talking about taking money out of the system. We're just talking about putting less money in. And the so-called taper tantrum does everything we would expect it to do at that point. Commodities get rocked. Emerging markets get hammered. Currencies are all over the place. Nothing actually happened that day in the global economy. That was all forward pricing on expectations of a Fed policy shift. And so in February of 2014, the Fed eventually does begin tapering its asset purchases, which you can see what happens after that, before eliminating those asset purchases completely in October of that year. And now, so-called liftoff has moved us from a world of QE to a world of QT, quantitative tightening. And that's when the market really starts to go into reversal. That's when the market really starts to go into reversal. And you know as well as I do that when the first money leaves the peripheries of the market, that sets off a, a rush for the exit, right? A complete stampede of that herd mentality. And that's the volatility that we're seeing today. That's the volatility. So, so to some extent, this second consequence of QE, this volatility, is really just a result of that first major consequence of QE. Right? It's the green shoots of growth that are starting to pop up now that have caused Fed officials to pull back on the liquidity reins. And I have to say that the big surprise, that we're, the big surprise, we were all shocked by this. We're all shocked by how messy this unwind is. We're all shocked by the emergence of these bubbles. It's shocking. Can't, can't imagine that, the, that asset prices were overvalued. Do you know that the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio on the S&P last year peaked at 27? The average cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio over the last 100 years is 16. We peaked at 27 last year, a multiple of 27. Brazil, between 2008 and 2011, saw its currency, the real, appreciate by 40%. 40%. Now, as far as I remember, we weren't just in recession in those years. We were in depression, yet somehow Brazil magically figured out the secret formula to ride above that. South Africa saw the RAND appreciate by 45% over those years. So it's no surprise to me that those are two countries that are getting hit the hardest with this unwind. So we are now seeing seven years of unreality unwinding. And maybe, maybe a bit of an overshoot on the downside. And markets have no idea what to do. They have no idea what to do. They're testing floors. The problem is that as they do that, this volatility, this emerging volatility, has having a very severe impact on a big chunk of the global economy, about half the global economy, if you want to be more technical. The collapse in commodity prices has hit emerging markets and has hit emerging markets hard, many of which rely on the proceeds from these primary industries. And so export receipts are down. Government revenues are suffering. Corporate profits are shrinking. As a result, appetite for emerging market financial assets have also been hammered. We saw net capital outflows last year from the emerging markets of $735 billion. That was a first year of net capital outflows since 1988. And so the resulting impact on emerging market currencies is now making all that foreign currency debt a lot more difficult to carry. And that's raising concerns around all those emerging market corporates that stocked up on all that cheap foreign currency debt over the last couple of years. Right, that $19 trillion in emerging market corporate debt that was all dependent on, you know, relatively strong currencies. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean in plain speak? Well, what it means is ultimately slower growth out of the emerging markets, which pretty much already saw growth cut in half last year to 4% from a post-crisis peak of 7.5%. And so, in this Olympic year, the race is on. I'll say the race between the two main consequences of QE, growth and volatility. Now, if growth wins out, that's going to cascade through the global economy and it's going to deal with, it's going to help resolve many of the issues around volatility. Right? Equity markets are going to settle as earnings return. Currencies are going to find an equilibrium. Speculative swings are going to ease. Emerging market debt ratios are going to start to stabilize. The big concern these days that you're, you're hearing up on this panel is that it seems to be this second consequence of QE, this volatility, that seems to be transmitted through the global economy a lot quicker than the first. And that's the big concern that markets have these days, or that, we, that you should have these days. Domestic demand fundamentals in the United States remain solid, but consumers in the US have shown a propensity to start saving more, because they're not sure, they're not 100, consumer confidence is back to its historical average, but consumers still aren't 100% sure that we're not out of the woods yet. So they're not willing to put their money on the table. 
Turbulent financial markets can become self-fulfilling, hitting household wealth and impacting, in, in many ways, hurting the, the consumption outlook here, hitting confidence, hitting consumption. Businesses in the United States have shown a propensity, have shown a willingness to sit tight on ever greater piles of cash. The slowdown in emerging markets can also hit the, the global recovery, impacting countries like Germany that are very dependent on the emerging markets. To say you know, nothing of the influx of a million refugees into that country over the last year alone. And so this could trigger a bit of a feedback loop, which in turn fuels more financial market choppiness, which hits confidence, which hits the real sector, which hits the financial markets, which hits confidence, which and kind of sends us down this, this vicious spiral. And if that's the case, if this volatility wins out, then I'll say that the blowback from these negative consequences of QE will squash the global recovery before it has a chance to take hold. And that may be why you have central banks, like the ECB, like the BOJ, like the PBOC, that have diverged from the Fed and are taking out that downside protection risk, extending that so-called central bank put. Because this is a global economy that has become addicted to cheap money and credit bubbles. So who's going to win? All right, that's the $9 trillion question. Who's going to win? I guess if, if you've asked me to come here and talk to you, you're looking at me to answer that question. I, I'll tell you the truth is, you know, um, like was said by the speaker earlier, I, I don't know. I don't know because, and, and I'll say something else, is no one knows, regardless of what they're telling you. Because there are an enormous amount of factors at play here. A huge amount of forces, some of which are predictable, some of which we forecast, we do a good job forecasting. Other which cannot be, predict, cannot be forecast. The animal spirits in the market, let's say. But I can tell you this. Any divergence between so-called developed and emerging economies can only be but transient. So-called decoupling cannot persist as a stable feature of a truly globalized economy. Because while emerging markets may account for, what, 57% of global GDP, they do not drive the global economy, not yet at least. Remember, 11 cents of every dollar in the world comes directly from the US consumer. You add the rest of the OECD, that jumps to 26 cents. 26 cents of every dollar in the world starts with the OECD consumer. Let's take Asia as an example. Because of global supply chains, much of the trade that happens in Asia is, is in bits and pieces. It's in components, right? So to some extent, it illustrates the extent to which that region doesn't exist in a vacuum. No region exists in a vacuum anymore. The World Bank did a study in 2008 that suggested that 85% of intra-regional trade in Asia ultimately ends up in goods that are exported to the EU, to Japan, to the US, to the so-called developed world, right? Now, it's a dated study, 2008, but if anything, the number is higher now, and it illustrates the extent to which that region is dependent on the rest of the world. The extent to which all regions of the world are kind of interdependent on each other. So while globalization helped facilitate the negative consequences of QE, pushing volatility to the far corners of the earth through international capital markets and, let's say, technologies that allow for real-time trading, we believe, I believe, that it's going to be globalization that gets us out of this. It's going to be globalization that gets us out of this, allowing for the transmission of growth through international investment and international trade. A rejuvenated U.S. consumer and a stronger U.S. dollar, remember, a strong U.S. dollar gives the U.S. consumer a far more purchasing power, gives businesses in the United States, when they're looking for all that capacity that they don't have at home, they're looking elsewhere, puts everything else on sale. Every other country, assets in every other country is now on sale for the U.S. business. So a reinvigorated U.S. consumer, a business, U.S. businesses that are, are looking for capacity, a stronger U.S. dollar is going to help spread growth first to Europe, and then beyond to, to, let's say, the supplier countries like China. And then beyond to the suppliers of the suppliers, the raw material providers, let's say. Before long, that has the impact of raising the prices of those raw materials, those commodities. And that sets off a bit of a virtuous cycle. So where does that leave our forecast? Well, the world is in the process of seeing seven years of unreality unwinding. And again, maybe a bit of an overshoot on the downside. We do believe that, you know, by and large, this, the, the, the bear market and things like oil prices has, has finally come to an end. Right? We finally brought supplies or, or, or production down in line with where demand is. 
But we're seeing seven years of unreality unwinding. And again, maybe a bit of an overshoot on the downside. And markets are testing floors. They don't know what to do. That leaves enormous opportunities for the rest of us. Now, it's not going to be easy. We have to know where to look and what we're looking for. We have to partner with institutions that understand the risks inherent in these markets and have the ability to mitigate those risks. We also need to understand that this volatility is going to be around for some time. Right? We are seeing the unwind of an unprecedented surge in liquidity. And the unprecedented nature of the surge suggests to me that the unwind is also going to be, the, the, the unwind is going to be without precedent. And it's likely going to be carried out in stages, stages of, of trial and error. And in that time, anything can happen. Nothing is too absurd. Nothing is too ridiculous in that time. I'll say off the record in some ways, as a forecaster, I'm an economist and a forecaster, I find point in time forecasts in an environment like this are useless. They're totally useless. First of all, they're impossible, but they're useless because nothing is too absurd in this environment. You know, when, when oil was, was really on the slide, people were asking, asking us, how low can oil prices go? You know, to some extent, I was saying oil prices can go to zero. No one knows. Nothing is too absurd in this environment. The question becomes, do they stay there or not? Where are the trends taking us? And where do things stabilize? And ultimately, what does that mean for your business planning over the next five to 10 years? So I'll stop there, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Thank you.